Datadog is a monitoring, security, and analytics platform for developers, IT operations teams, security engineers, and business users in the cloud age. Their SaaS platform integrates and automates infrastructure monitoring, APM, and log management to provide unified, real-time observability of their customers' entire technology stack. Used by organizations of all sizes and across a wide range of industries, they enable digital transformation and cloud migration, accelerate time to market, reduce mean time to resolution, and track key business metrics. Give Datadog a try with a 14-day free trial. Listeners of the Hansel Minutes podcast will also receive a free Datadog t-shirt. Check them out at datadoghq.com slash Hansel Minutes. That's datadoghq.com slash Hansel Minutes. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today we're talking with Therese Johnson. She's a VP of Sales Strategy at Salesforce. She's worked as a senior director at Microsoft and been on a ton of boards and a bunch of great nonprofit work. And now you have written a book called Becoming a Digital Unicorn that folks can check out at becomingadigitalunicorn.com. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I am so happy to be here with you. I appreciate it. So, you know, when I look at your LinkedIn, I always love to look at people's backgrounds and explore them, even though we've known each other for a very long time. The thing that I note is just a constant uh, sense of exploration and reinvention. You did AI and you did IoT, you did strategy, cross solutions, you've done mixed reality. Do you, did you always reinvent yourself? I think always, you know, probably I've always had this just this insatiable passion for learning that I couldn't sit in a classroom. I'm one of those ones that left college more times than I can count on one hand because I've always been attracted to startup. You know, you sit me in class and I have to listen to lecture, but then you take me back out into the world of startup and everything you had to figure it out. So yeah, I think I've always been attracted to figuring things out, a lot of ambiguity and having to do things with my hands and with my mind all together versus theory. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. And in the book, uh, you that's a theme that runs through it is that hunger for knowledge that you really insisted to be a digital unicorn. As you say, you have to make that hunger a lifelong pursuit. I told someone earlier that it's like food for the soul. And she asked me, well, I know what food for the soul means for me, but what does it mean for you? And I said, because the more you feed my mind, it's like neural networks. It just connects. And then the next concept connects to the next. And then before you know it, any ideas that I had, they begin to breathe life because they're connected. They're connected to other people's ideas. They get connected to other people's vision, to what they're passionate about. And so that we're not all existing alone. And I think that is probably the main thing I wanted to happen with this book is you see what's happening. We're going into worlds that we don't even begin to understand the level of you know greatness that technology is breathing life into the world and into each of us. But what's happening is many of us are treating life the same year after year after year. And I don't know about you, Scott, but I feel like in the space that you and I live and breathe, you also have to reinvent everything that you know year upon year mm-hmm. because it's like a puzzle. Things might not fit. So yeah, knowledge and wisdom is food for my soul. It just mm-hmm. is. And that idea of connecting all these different dots, you're talking about how things are changing, new technologies are coming in. If a new technology emerges, you're going to want to have a big um uh, knowledge base to pull from to say, well, how does this new technology apply to the ones that I already understand and then plug them in together? That's right. Because think about the world. I think I talk about, you know, we've been hearing a lot about metaverse. We've been hearing a lot about, and you know, when we think about, and then it's not all theory, uh, what's happening is we are meshing the worlds of the virtual reality of digital intelligence and our physical being. So it's requiring something new of us. It's requiring us to have new interactions. 
user experiences. So even when we design UX and user experiences, it's different coming from a virtual to a physical world and then applying digital intelligence where all of these are converging together. So then we can't have the virtual things and the digital things becoming out, outsmarting the, um, you know, we have a human algorithm that we've also have to cultivate. And so what I've been saying is, it really is a beautiful season for us to really start to look at ourselves in a differentiated way. And that's what the book is about. It's about how is it that we start to set ourselves apart over and over again, that as the world evolves and as technology evolves, and as we begin to see disruptions at levels we've never seen before, how do we ourselves begin to disrupt ourselves, evolve, and move to levels of greatness that have that are unseen. Mm-hmm. And imagine if we all a hundred people understood their purpose in this season, and then those hundred people went out and began to light up the world in ways that we've never even begun to imagine. And I think that's the kind of the kind of opportunity that we have before us today. In a time of social media where we're overwhelmed, not just with information, but also also with uh, stuff that other people are doing that almost seems designed to make us feel bad about ourselves. You're saying in your book that one should really focus on discovering their own uniqueness. It's hard to feel unique when there's so many darn people out there and a lot of them just seem to be doing the same thing, but also better than me. So how do you find that inside yourself to be unique and and cultivate those talents that you have when it seems like there's just so much darn talent out there and they're better than me and and my phone is designed to tell me that I'm no good? I think you hit upon something that I've been extremely passionate about and it is how content is infiltrating our minds. Think about all the content that's out there and how we're digitizing content. And the content by design, I don't think is always meant to aid towards the side of our brain that is the hardest to convince. It's easier to take negative concepts, you know, the way that neurons work in our brains. You know, if you think about neurosciences, it teaches us and helps us understand that neurons trigger, neurons trigger, and they activate. So the negativity and all the things that we say negative about ourselves, the, the you know, fight or flight, that whole syndrome, that is the easiest to get to. And so meanwhile, we are allowing content to tell us what we are not able to do instead of being on the front lines, because it's harder to tell yourself that you can shape the future. It's much more difficult to say that you can be on the front lines, shaping what the new world look like even when you have no clue and don't even understand your own identity in a world that seems to be leaving so many behind. And so that is the key here, is that if we are able to tap into something extremely powerful in our minds, shift our mindsets, take a moment to stop everything around us, and then retrain our habits, take a moment to say, I'm going to stop and make mindfulness an intentional and deliberate habit in my life. And I'm going to tell my mind that the things that beat me up every day, tell me I can't do it. Tell me that the world is leaving me behind, that I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. And I have no seat at the table, but I am going to make a deliberate intentional effort to now do what's hardest to do, which is to train your mind to shape the future. And it's a different, it takes a different, something different in us than when we're just going to be consumers of the world, than when we're going to go out and be makers of the world. Right? Yeah. Yesterday, <clears throat> yesterday, my we went out to dinner and my 15 year old was getting in the car. Uh, we were all in the car and he was getting in and he had on his air, his air pod in one ear and he was getting his shoes on and he had, was what, looking at TikTok or something and he stubbed his foot on the side of the door and he got really mad. He went from zero to within just a second. And that the, 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 the instantaneous anger and frustration kind of happened. And I said, 
after he calmed down and said, I said, I said, where are you? Where are you? And he's like, I don't know. And I said, well, hang on a second. Let's just sit here in the driveway, take out your AirPod, turn off the TikTok. Let's just breathe for just a second and just tell me where you're at. And he's like, oh, I'm thinking about this paper I got to write for AP you know, history. And I was like, but you got an AirPod in your ear. You've got TikTok in your hand. You stubbed your, your toe and you got mad about not being present and then hurt yourself. Maybe getting stubbed in the toe was a little wake up call from the universe that you need to be now and not wherever you were a minute ago. Wow. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Wow. Now that's a moment. Because imagine what would have happened if you hadn't taken a moment to take a step back. He would have gone on and his trajectory would have changed. It would have shifted. And I think that's the key. It's time for, oh, it is okay for us to stub our toe right now and feel a little pain. COVID unleashed a lot in us where we all felt a lot of pain in a lot of different areas. And now it is time for us to take a step back in a moment to say at the end of the day, what am I purpose to do in this moment in history? In this historical time, what was I meant to be? And I think that's the key is, so now we go back to having all of these worlds coming together. And I'll give you a good example. My husband was in financial accounting. That's what he graduated in. And I remember having a conversation with him. He's like, he's eight to five, Monday through Friday, you know the world, working for a healthcare company in, in, in his traditional world. And then he's seeing this other world, right, of, you know, traveling around and here I am just inventing and dreaming. And he's like, you know, I didn't even know if that's a space I can get into. He said, because I've been doing this work for more than 10 years. So he and I sat down and I said, really, you are digital. And I said, the key is you're working out of Excel. There is a new world called Power BI and Power Apps. And I said, just do me a favor. Take the weekend and just go to the online MOOCs, online class, and just you to me, whatever that looks like. And just start to take the courses, right? LinkedIn learning, all of it. Scott, he couldn't quit learning. Again, it goes back to what are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your soul? We can either do squid game all week and binge, which I'll, you know, don't mind that. (laughs) Netflix binging. Or we can binge on knowledge and wisdom that are going to take us places that we never could have thought before. His whole world over the last two years works total contract completely for a company, not even in the same region. He uh, now develops, all he does is data visualization. He's now moved from financial accounting to a data visualization specialist. Now, this person who was traditional, who didn't understand digital, now building power apps for companies, now building visualization. I think that this is the point, is that now he's offering something new of value to a new space. And he is securing and future-proofing his his entire DNA, you know, his being, right? To where he can now go scuba diving in Hawaii while he's working, which we did take four weeks. And we did spend four weeks in Hawaii working. And then we get off and then go off. And so we created an entire new paradigm in our lives, all because why he chose to go do something different that he'd never done before, but he had someone in his corner supporting and championing and making him excited to go off and do the real work. And it takes a little sacrifice, but this is what we're saying that we're ready to become unique in the world and to find something new of value that you can bring to the market. And I'm hearing a a theme of intentionality, and you said deliberate practice. Like I was helping my son, you know, be in the moment by simply deliberately breathing and just taking a second. But it sounds like you're almost sitting down with yourself 
and strategizing with yourself as if you were a business and thinking, what's my business plan here? What exactly are we doing here today? You probably have meetings on the calendar with yourself, don't you, to figure out what is it I'm doing? I block time. (laughs) See? I do. I block time to research. Yep. That's like, that's like my everything, you know? Um, I create space and mm-hmm. moments and I put it on my calendar that I'm going to have deep think time. Mm-hmm. I tell the ones, everyone around me today, have your deep think time. Folks that work for me, I have your deep with me, partner with me. Yeah. Spend, put five hours on the calendar, go deep think, and then come back and let me know. And part of that are the techniques that, you know, we talk about. Mm-hmm. Some people go deep into, and it is it maybe sometimes a fearful thing. Mm-hmm sit down and stop and be still. But in that still moment, when it is purposeful, and when you really start to see what's happening in the world, and and Scott, that's what this is all about. Technology is thrusting itself into areas that we are now thirsting for new minds. We are thirsting for new people to come to the table that we never even begin to understand how could they begin to imagine and shape the future for us and with us. And we co-develop together. And who can we activate that didn't even see themselves having a seat at the table of innovation? How do we start to rally that and yeah. to bring all of that to the forefront? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that we create something unique that's that's not been done before. If you have a mission-critical application, you don't deploy it as a monolith anymore. There's a reason Kubernetes is so popular. So why are you still using a monolithic database? DB is a distributed SQL database that you want for your global applications. It's 100% open source and designed to be resilient and horizontally scalable out of the box. It's PostgreSQL compatible, so you can start using it right away without learning a whole new query language. And you can distribute it wherever your application takes you, across availability zones, regions, and even cloud vendors. Go to yugabyte.com, that's Y-U-G-A-B-Y-T-E dot com, and try the free beta of Yugabyte Cloud. It's a fully hosted and managed Yugabyte DB as a service, giving you a distributed SQL database for global applications with no operational overhead. It's effortless distributed SQL for global apps. Well, you and I have both had jobs that didn't exist as jobs when we started, which means that whether it be my 16-year-old or someone who's on the listening to the podcast right now uh, is probably needs to start training themselves for a job that doesn't exist so that they're ready when it does or when they invent it themselves. That, I think that that's the other thing. It's interesting. Um, I had a young person whose parent gave them a copy of the book. Um, he's 17 year old, uh, and he just had all these ideas in his head and, you know, on hindsight, he's like, but the world is telling me that these are things that I can't do. He said, and I have, you know, my parents have never been in this space before, so I don't really have anyone that can help. Again, we talk about cultivating and creating a platform to cultivate people, to be able to think differently and then shape what they're thinking and to something that's going to be of value to the marketplace. That's all this is about. And so 100%, I agree that, um, you know, that especially with this next generation and, um, and, and their ability to be able to not be limited, um, for us to be able to unleash and create environments for them, like you do your son, for them to be able to not be limited by anything. I think that that is one of the most exciting things that we have before us right now, is we have no clue what's possible until we unleash all of this this capability that's stored up and then begin to just let people have the ability, you know, uh, to just say, I just want to show up and I don't care if it's broken pieces. I want the ability to know and understand where to take these pieces and then breathe life into them so that we can start something new that's not been done before. That's a hard platform to create for young people, especially. Yeah. I mean, people are down, right? We it, Last month was uh, March 2020. Next month is 2022. We have lost years. People are 
down. And if you're young, you've lost a fractional, like a significant percentage of your life. What do you tell someone when you're saying, when, when Teresa is saying, deploy your gifts and they're like saying, I don't have any gifts. I've got nothing. I don't even know where to start. What do we tell people to, to, when they have, when they don't feel they have any gifts to offer? You know, the first place I went, you can't fix what you can't see. You can't begin to unleash what you haven't cultivated. The first thing that I had to go back and do is I had to understand what was in my mind. What was in my mind was was just littered and it, it was stinking thinking, I call it. It was just stinky. How in the world can I get anything to market? How in the world can I unleash innovation? If I don't believe in anything that I have inside of me. So, Scott, it all starts with folks really starting to understand what's in their mind. And so I I went again and did the research and really tried to understand. I try to understand what how my mind thinks. Why is my mind so negative? There is a reason for that. And then once I quit believing what would pop up, because it it just it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Naturally, we are just, many of us, it's just a negative society. We got to be okay with that. We got to be okay that when you have a big idea, the first thing someone's going to say is, ah, that might not work. It's okay. So understand that and don't allow that to shape your activities. So that's number one. The second thing is discipline your mind towards the outcomes that you know you want to deliver to market. And so it really is about uncovering, I think, you know, when we start to think about the gifts that we have, when we start to think about our ability to show up to places and to offer something unique and differentiated that no one else has, it means you have to think about that. You have to sit down and take the time to say, what makes me leap? When I go off and I go do these two or three things, what in the world excites me? You have to start there and say, what makes me excited when I wake up in the morning. What in the world would I do if I didn't get paid? If I didn't, you know, have anybody offer me a paycheck, what would it be? It starts there. And then you peel back the layers to say, why? Why in the world was I born in my original intent on this earth? And if that is to solve problems with hunger, if that is to, because you have a passion for other people, then and you have a passion for the service business. Scott, it all starts at the end of the day with what makes us leap when we wake up in the mornings and our gifts there, it is connected there. And so we have to spend the time to cultivate those areas that truly excite us. Yeah. You, uh, in the book, you, you quote Einstein who says, uh, try not to become a man of success, but try to become a man of value. What I'm hearing you say, though, is you have to define what value means to you, what you value, what you care about, if you care about money, or if you care about people, if you care about connection, whatever the thing is, that's where you start. So if you ask somebody, what would you do if I didn't, if you didn't get paid and you could just be like, do whatever, like on Star Trek, everybody has food, everybody has clothes, nobody worries about their houses. What would you do? Would you be a sculptor? Would you be a teacher? Would you be an adventurer? Those are the real questions. And then that, that's the, the pyramid. That's the base of the pyramid that you build on top of, right? That's exactly right. You start there. And again, I, I think that we have a lot of noise coming our way. Social mm-hmm. media, all of the things every day that can help us stay distracted. And that's the other thing that I talk about is replacing habits. Mm. Um, we have to start new habits. I, and I, I really believe that in this season is that if, it is our habit to wake up in the morning and go to the phone. We get that. We have to document that and say every day I go to the phone, I eat breakfast, I go take a shower, I go to work, I sit and track, whatever that is. You have to notice it. When you say document it, that means you need to, you need to catch yourself. You need to go, oh my, I've been, my every phone day. is the first thing I touch in the morning. Is that intentional? Because you talked about Netflix a minute ago. I like Squid Game. I like Netflix but I do it with intentionality. I, I don't know if I told you about this, but one of my hacks is I can watch as much Netflix as I want as long as I'm on the treadmill when I'm doing it. And when I get tired, I don't get to watch Netflix anymore. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So I connected something that needed to get done, me working out, with something I wanted to do, Netflix. That is right? brilliant. And that was a habit that was new that you had to start. You had, right? I had to do it in order to In order to drive an outcome that you know needed to be driven. And that's it, my friend. That's it. I, I think that we've got to be okay. Number one, starting new habits. It all starts, again, that's the whole piece about disrupting yourself before you're disrupted because we the world is coming and it's going to be a time when, when it is so crucial that we're on the front edge of understanding what's going on around us. That's number one. Number two is once you unlock that, well, now in the mornings, now when I look at the phone, the first thing I do is go do research. I learn one new thing. So I'm still going to the phone. I'm just doing something. I'm being purposeful. Mm -hmm. And then once I go learn something new, then I can go off to TikTok and some of the other things. So the key is don't deny yourself the things that you want to do. It's integrate new habits that are going to create new motions in your mind, create greater intelligence, and then put you in a position of differentiation. When you walk up into a room, you're set apart because there are things that you understand about the world that only you can open your mouth and speak to that no one else can because it's part of your experience. It's your lens. It's the way you see things paired up with the research, paired up with your environment and everything around you. And so the key is now you're bringing something uh, completely that has been cultivated for you to deploy your gifts to deliver greater value in spaces that's never seen you before. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And you use that word deployed very intentionally. You don't you pick your words very carefully. And in the book, you call out very specifically that there's a difference between being employed and being deployed. Can you talk to me about that difference? Oh, yeah. I got that from a famous person who said that all the time is, you know, when you you could get fired from your job, <laughs> you can't get fired from your gifts. It was that simple. <laughs> and I thought that that was just my moment to say that all these years I've, I've cultivated myself to work for a job and I've done, you know, looked at the job skills and said, okay, let's go after this and X. And, but the day that I woke up and said, I want to add greater value to the spaces that I show up. There are 20 architects in your team. There are hundreds of engineers so when you walk into a room and everyone is speaking the same language, talking the same thing, how in the world? So I, you know, being who I am, want to be remembered. And not only that, I want to be the person that's shaping the vision. And so in order for me to be able to shape the vision, it means that when I walk away from an individual, they have to remember something unique about me. So Scott, the moment I tapped into that, and then people will re re begin to remember who I am. I'm like, wait a minute. So that means I just got to go study, understand what's happening in the world, meditate on it, apply wisdom to understanding and getting a deeper level of understanding of what's happening, and then show up in a room giving guidance that they had never heard before. So it is being able to cultivate your gifts beyond your own capacity and then being able to take research and deep studies into a place of wisdom. You power that together. Oh my goodness. That's the way that we can begin to reshape what we're seeing with the disproportionate amount of people who feel like they've been left out as the world continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. I've noticed in the book and also in chatting with you now and people who are listening will notice that, again, you pick your words carefully. You've said cultivate a lot. You don't just pick any random verb, right? The word cultivate doesn't just mean to like, uh, it means to prepare the land, you know, to get the crops ready. It means to break up the soil Ooh. that's like messed up soil that we're going to break up and make a new and then to raise the crops and turn them into something. So you, you picked that word, didn't you? So we're breaking habits. Mm -hmm. We're breaking ourselves. We're disrupting our area to reinvent. Mm -hmm. And then we're growing and we're watering ourselves with knowledge, with wisdom, with research, right? And then as we continue to grow, we're connecting 
right? We're not just, it's not for us and it's not for ourselves. It's all for such a greater good. And so you couldn't have said that better. I'm so glad that you connected the dots because it's a difference between learning and growing. And it's a huge difference between cultivating your entire being. Yeah, yeah. And then if you take these concepts that we're talking about, and again, these are in the book, and you then apply this idea of making new habits. Uh, I heard something really interesting a couple of days ago where someone said, if you go to the dentist once a year, your mouth is going to be a mess. But if you brush your teeth for two minutes in the morning and night, then the going to the dentist will be a non-event. So if you go to the gym and work out once a year, and you're going to wonder why I'm a mess. But if you go to the gym for 20 minutes, three times a week, something's going to happen. So what I'm hearing you say is this: these little moments of research, whether it be your husband who's gone from being in accounting to being a data scientist, or whether it be someone who's listening right now who might want to learn HTML or a new language or learn the cloud, a new habit, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, your, your bus ride, what are you doing on your bus ride? What are you doing on your morning walk that you could turn into an opportunity for cultivation? Uh, you just said something really awesome. <laughs> Imagine if you just continued to shape your mind. It's kind of like you're in the gym, you're doing, and all of a sudden one day you see stuff happening, stuff shaping. and Sneak up on you. It's just, and then, yes. Oh my gosh. And that's how our minds work. The more we fill it with the right things, and then we do it over and over again and go deeper. You know, a perfect example is, I'm just going to go to the landscaper. I'm just going to, because this is real stuff. I just got to, you got to work with me real quick. The landscaper, he would wait for a check uh, that, you know, my grandma (laughs) might write him and, uh, you know, like once every two months. So it's taking him a long time to get his payables because he's so great to all the, you know, the people on the street and on the block. He, um, you know, faced a situation where his business wasn't growing. He needed new revenue models. And so he and I just sat down, had a conversation and said, listen, there are tools out there. You can become digital so that when you show up, people's bank accounts already in to in the tool. And so when you check a box and you give it to them, you, you hit a button, they have to do nothing. You get your payable, you get your receivables. Everything's right there. So that's number one. So let's, let's get that digital, simple, 19 bucks a month, whatever that looks like, right, Scott? Mm-hmm. Then you want to create new revenue models. Oh my goodness, what differentiates you? Well, augmented reality has apps. Download the app. Now imagine letting your customer take a picture of their front yard. They take a picture of the front yard, load it in your AR app, and now you've given them a beautiful landscape of what's possible in 3D. My goodness, that costs you barely nothing. And so the key is to think digital, the ability to be able to change the mindset, the ability to be able to get out of old thinking and to show up open for things that you never could begin to understand how to apply your business. So now you're now moving into landscaping. You're now digitizing your business where people can interact with you on demand. You're giving guidance and advice now inside of your own app on how people can be able to maintain their long, you're writing blogs. So now you've moved yourself into a position from traditional ways and habits that you held on to for years. And now you've moved yourself into the digital world by just being open and changing your mindset. That's it. Fantastic. You can read about all of these concepts, the things that you're talking about. This example, this great example you just gave of your landscaper who has gone from being employed to now being deployed to help others with their uh, their skills in a new digital world. The book is Becoming a Digital Unicorn. You can check it out at becomingadigitalunicorn.com. You can pick it up on your Kindle today. Thank you so much for chatting with me. You have been awesome. This has been great time spent as always, Scott. You're amazing and I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.